Chapter Twenty of Great Expectations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, Chapter Twenty. The journey from our town to the metropolis was a journey of about five hours. It was a little past midday when the four-horse stagecoach by which I was a passenger got into the ravel of traffic frayed out about the Cross Keys, Wood Street, Cheapside, London. We Britons had at that time particularly settled that it was treasonable to doubt our having and our being the best of everything. Otherwise, while I was scared by the immensity of London, I think I might have had some faint doubts whether it were not ugly, crooked, narrow, and dirty. Mr. Jaggers had duly sent me his address. It was Little Britain, and he had written after it on his card, just out of Smithfield and close by the coach office. Nevertheless, a hackney coachman, who seemed to have as many capes to his greasy greatcoat as he was years old, packed me up in his coach and hemmed me in with a folding and jingling barrier of steps as if he were going to take me fifty miles. His getting on the, his box, which I remember to have been decorated with an old weather-stained pea-green hammer-cloth, moth-eaten into rags, was quite a work of time. It was a wonderful equipage, with six great coronets outside, and ragged things behind for I don't know how many footmen to hold on by, and a harrow below them, to prevent amateur footmen from yielding to the temptation. I had scarcely had time to enjoy the coach, and to think how like a straw-yard it was, and yet how like a rag-shop, and to wonder why the horses' nose-bags were kept inside, when I observed the coachman beginning to get down, as if we were going to stop presently. And stop we presently did, in a gloomy street, at certain offices with an open door, whereon was painted Mr. Jaggers. "'How much?' I asked the coachman. The coachman answered, "'A shilling, unless you wish to make it more.' I naturally said I had no wish to make it more. "'Then it must be a shilling,' observed the coachman. "'I don't want to get into trouble. I know him.' He darkly closed an eye at Mr. Jagger's name and shook his head. When he had got his shilling, and had in course of time completed the ascent to his box, and had got away— which appeared to relieve his mind, I went into the front office with my little portmanteau in my hand, and asked, Was Mr. Jaggers at home? He is not, returned the clerk. He is in court at present. Am I addressing Mr. Pip? I signified that he was addressing Mr. Pip. Mr. Jaggers left word, Would you wait in his room? He couldn't say how long he might be, having a case on but it stands to reason, his time being valuable, that he won't be longer than he can help. With those words the clerk opened a door, and ushered me into an inner chamber at the back. Here we found a gentleman with one eye, in a velveteen suit and knee-breeches, who wiped his nose with his sleeve on being interrupted in the perusal of the newspaper. "'Go and wait outside, Mike,' said the clerk. I began to say that I hoped I was not interrupting, when the clerk shoved this gentleman out with as little ceremony as I ever saw used, and tossing his fur cap out after him, left me alone. Mr. Jagger's room was lighted by a skylight only, and was a most dismal place. The skylight, eccentrically pitched like a broken head, and the distorted adjoining houses looking as if they had twisted themselves to peep down at me through it. There were not so many papers about, as I should have expected to see, and there were some odd objects about that I should not have expected to see, such as an old rusty pistol, a sword in a scabbard, several strange-looking boxes and packages, and two dreadful casts on a shelf of faces peculiarly swollen and twitchy about the nose. Mr. Jaggers's own high-backed chair was of a deadly black horsehair with rows of brass nails round it, like a coffin, and I fancied I could see how he leaned back in it, and bit his forefinger at his clients. The room was but small, and the clients seemed to have had a habit of backing up against the wall. 
the wall, especially opposite to Mr. Jaggers's chair, being greasy with shoulders. I recalled, too, that the one-eyed gentleman had shuffled forth against the wall when I was the innocent cause of his being turned out. I sat down in the clientel chair, placed over against Mr. Jaggers's chair, and became fascinated by the dismal atmosphere of the place. I called to mind that the clerk had the same air of knowing something to everybody else's disadvantage, as his master had. I wondered how many other clerks there were upstairs, and whether they all claimed to have the same detrimental mastery of their fellow-creatures. I wondered what was the history of all the odd litter about the room, and how it came there. I wondered whether the two swollen faces were of Mr. Jaggers's family, and, if he were so unfortunate as to have had a pair of such ill-looking relations, why he stuck them on that dusty perch for the blacks and flies to settle on, instead of giving them a place at home. Of course I had no experience of a London summer day, and my spirits may have been oppressed by the hot exhausted air, and by the dust and grit that lay thick on everything but I sat wondering and waiting in Mr. Jaggers' close room, until I really could not bear the two casts on the shelf above Mr. Jaggers' chair, and got up and went out. When I told the clerk that I would take a turn in the air while I waited, he advised me to go round the corner and I should come into Smithfield. So I came into Smithfield, and the shameful place, being all a smear with filth and fat and blood and foam, seemed to stick to me so I rubbed it off with all possible speed by turning into a street where I saw the great black dome of St. Paul's bulging at me from behind a grim stone building which a bystander said was Newgate Prison. Following the wall of the jail, I found the roadway covered with straw to deaden the noise of passing vehicles, and from this, and from the quantity of people standing about smelling strongly of spirits and beer, I inferred that the trials were on. While I looked about me here, an exceedingly dirty and partially drunk minister of justice asked me if I would like to step in and hear a trial or so, informing me that he could give me a front place for half a crown, whence I should command a full view of the Lord Chief Justice in his wig and robes, mentioning that awful personage like waxwork, and presently offering him at the reduced price of eighteen pence. As I declined the proposal on the plea of an appointment, he was so good as to take me into a yard and show me where the gallows was kept, and also where people were publicly whipped, and then he showed me the debtor's door, out of which culprits came to be hanged, heightening the interest of that dreadful portal, by giving me to understand that four on em would come out at that door the day after to-morrow, at eight in the morning, to be killed in a row. This was horrible, gave me a sickening idea of London the more so as the Lord Chief Justice's proprietor wore, from his hat down to his boots and up again to his pocket-handkerchief inclusive, mildewed clothes, which had evidently not belonged to him originally, and which I took it into my head he had bought cheap of the executioner. Under these circumstances I thought myself well rid of him for a shilling. I dropped into the office to ask if Mr. Jaggers had come in yet, and I found he had not, and I strolled out again. This time I made the tour of Little Britain, and turned into Bartholomew Close, and now I became aware that other people were waiting about for Mr. Jaggers, as well as I. There were two men of secret appearance lounging in Bartholomew Close, and thoughtfully fitting their feet into the cracks of the pavement as they talked together, one of whom said to the other when they first passed me that Jaggers would do it if it was to be done. There was a knot of three men and two women standing at a corner, and one of the women was crying on her dirty shawl, and the other comforted her by saying, as she pulled her own shawl over her shoulders, "'Jaggers is for him, Melia, and what more could you have?' There was a red-eyed little Jew who came into the clothes while I was loitering there, in company with a second little Jew whom he had sent upon an errand. And while the messenger was gone, I remarked this Jew— who was of a highly excitable temperament, performing a jig of anxiety under a lamp-post, and accompanying himself in a kind of frenzy with the words, "'Oh, Jaggerth, 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 all other than Kagmagerth, give me Jaggerth!' These testimonies to the popularity of my guardian made a deep impression on me, 
and I admired and wondered more than ever. At length, as I was looking out at the iron gate of Bartholomew Close into Little Britain, I saw Mr. Jaggers coming across the road towards me. All the others who were waiting saw him at the same time, and there was quite a rush at him. Mr. Jaggers, putting a hand on my shoulder and walking me on at his side, without saying anything to me, addressed himself to his followers. First he took the two secret men. "'Now I have nothing to say to you,' said Mr. Jaggers, throwing his finger at them. "'I want to know no more than I know. As to the result, it's a toss-up. I told you from the first it was a toss-up. Have you paid Wemmick?' "'We made the money up this morning, sir,' said one of the men submissively, while the other perused Mr. Jaggers' face. "'I don't ask you when you made it up, or where, or whether you made it up at all. Has Wemmick got it?' "'Yes, sir,' said both the men together. "'Very well, then you may go. No, I won't have it,' said Mr. Jaggers, waving his hand at them to put them behind him. "'If you say a word to me, I'll throw up the case.' "'We thought, Mr. Jaggers,' one of the men began, pulling off his hat. "'That's what I told you not to do,' said Mr. Jaggers. "'You thought. I think for you that's enough for you. If I want you, I know where to find you. I don't want you to find me. Now I won't have it. I won't hear a word.' The two men looked at one another as Mr. Jaggers waved them behind again, and humbly fell back and were heard no more. "'And now you,' said Mr. Jaggers, suddenly stopping, and turning on the two women with the shawls, from whom the three men had meekly separated, "'Oh, Amelia, is it?' "'Yes, Mr. Jaggers.' "'And do you remember,' retorted Mr. Jaggers, "'that but for me you wouldn't be here and couldn't be here?' "'Oh, yes, sir,' exclaimed both women together, "'Lord bless you, sir. Well, we knows that.' "'Then why,' said Mr. Jaggers, "'do you come here?' "'My bill, sir,' the crying woman pleaded. "'Now I tell you what,' said Mr. Jaggers, "'once for all. If you don't know that your bill's in good hands, I know it. And if you come here bothering about your bill, I'll make an example of both your bill and you, and let him slip through my fingers.' "'Have you paid Wemmick?' "'Oh, yes, sir, every farthing.' "'Very well. Then you have done all you have got to do. Say another word, one single word, and Wemmick shall give you your money back.' This terrible threat caused the two women to fall off immediately. No one remained now but the excitable Jew, who had already raised the skirts of Mr. Jagger's coat to his lips several times. "'I don't know this man.' said Mr. Jaggers, in the same devastating strain. "'What does this fellow want?' "'My dear Mr. Jaggerth, hone brother to Habraham Lathareth?' "'Who's he?' said Mr. Jaggers. "'Let go of my coat.' The suitor, kissing the hem of the garment again before relinquishing it, replied, "'Habraham Lathareth, on Thithbithian a plate.' "'You're too late,' said Mr. Jaggers. "'I am over the way.' "'Holy Father, Mr. Daggerth! cried my excitable acquaintance, turning white. "'Don't say you're again Abraham Lathareth. "'I am,' said Mr. Jaggers, "'and there's an end of it. Get out of the way.' "'Mr. Jaggers, half a moment. My own cousin's gone to Mr. Wemmick at this present minute, to offer him any terms. Mr. Jaggers, half a quarter of a moment.' if you'd have the condescension to be bought off from the other side, at any superior price, money no object, Mr. Jaggers, Mr. My guardian threw his supplicant off with supreme indifference, and left him dancing on the pavement, as if it were red-hot. Without further interruption we reached the front office, where we found the clerk and the man in velveteen with the fur cap. "'Here's Mike,' said the clerk getting down from his stool and approaching Mr. Jaggers confidentially. "'Oh,' said Mr. Jaggers, turning to the man, who was pulling a lock of hair in the middle of his forehead, like the bull and Cock Robin pulling at the bell-rope, "'your man comes on this afternoon. Well?' "'Well, Master Jaggers,' 
returned Mike, in the voice of a sufferer from a constitutional cold, "'Arter a deal of trouble, I found one, sir, as might do.' "'What is he prepared to swear?' "'Well, Master Jaggers,' said Mike, wiping his nose on his fur cap this time, "'in a general way, anything.' Mr. Jaggers suddenly became most irate. "'Now I warned you before,' said he, throwing his forefinger at the terrified client, "'that if you ever presumed to talk in that way here, I'd make an example of you. You infernal scoundrel, how dare you tell me that?' The client looked scared, but bewildered, too, as if he were unconscious what he had done. "'Spoony!' said the clerk in a low voice, giving him a stir with his elbow. "'Soft head! Need you say it face to face?' "'Now I ask you, you blundering booby,' said my guardian very sternly, "'once more, and for the last time, what the man you have brought here is prepared to swear.' Mike looked hard at my guardian, as if he were trying to learn a lesson from his face, and slowly replied, "'Hather to character!' or having been in his company and never left him all the night in question. Now be careful. In what station of life is this man? Mike looked at his cap, and looked at the floor, and looked at the ceiling, and looked at the clerk, and even looked at me, before beginning to reply in a nervous manner, We've dressed him up like— When my guardian blustered out, What? You will, will you? Spoony! added the clerk again, with another stir. After some helpless casting about, Mike brightened and began again. "'He's dressed like a spectable pieman, a sort of a pastry-cook. "'Is he here?' asked my guardian. "'I left him,' said Mike, "'a-settin' on some door-steps round the corner. "'Take him past that window, and let me see him.' The window indicated was the office window. We all three went to it, behind the wire blind, and presently saw the client go by in an accidental manner, with a murderous-looking tall individual, in a short suit of white linen and a paper cap. This guileless confectioner was not by any means sober, and had a black eye and the green stage of recovery, which was painted over. "'Tell him to take his witness away directly,' said my guardian to the clerk, in extreme disgust and ask him what he means by bringing such a fellow as that. My guardian then took me into his own room, and while he lunched, standing from a sandwich-box and a pocket-flask of sherry, he seemed to bully his very sandwich as he ate it, informed me what arrangements he had made for me. I was to go to Barnard's Inn, to young Mr. Pocket's rooms, where a bed had been sent in for my accommodation, I was to remain with young Mr. Pocket until Monday. On Monday I was to go with him to his father's house on a visit, that I might try how I liked it. Also I was told what my allowance was to be, it was a very liberal one, and had handed to me from one of my guardian's drawers the cards of certain tradesmen with whom I was to deal for all kinds of clothes and such other things as I could in reason want. "'You will find your credit good, Mr. Pip,' said my guardian, whose flask of sherry smelt like a whole caskful, as he hastily refreshed himself. But I shall by this means be able to check your bills, and to pull you up if I find you outrunning the constable. Of course you'll go wrong somehow, but that's no fault of mine. After I had pondered a little over this encouraging sentiment, I asked Mr. Jaggers if I could send for a coach. He said it was not worth while, I was so near my destination, Wemmick should walk round with me, if I pleased. I then found that Wemmick was the clerk in the next room. Another clerk was rung down from upstairs to take his place while he was out, and I accompanied him into the street, after shaking hands with my guardian. We found a new set of people lingering outside, but Wemmick made a way among them by saying coolly yet decisively, "'I tell you it's no use.' He won't have a word to say to one of you, and we soon got clear of them and went on side by side. End of chapter.